Eh, muy buenos días a todos. Eh, bienvenidos al seminario del Ministerio de Política Pública y Salud del Instituto de la Unidad Política Pública del Instituto de Obesidad. Eh, hoy tenemos el gran gusto de tener a un ponente de primera, que es Eduardo Gómez. Me voy a cambiar a, a, a inglés. Este, Eduardo Gómez es Associate Professor and Director of the Public Policy in Health Institute at Lehi University. I'm never sure how to pronounce Lehi. Le Lehi. 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 Sorry. Uh, he's got a PhD in political science from Brown and has a master's in uh, international relations at, from the University of Chicago. And he studies his BA at the University of Virginia. His research centers on world uh, health politics uh, and policy with special attention to, to emerging countries. He's got three books, last one being on geopolitics and health, confronting obesity, AIDS, and tuberculosis in the emerging BRICS economies. He has published his research in several journals and, um, and is very active in uh, the media on, on topics of his research. His current book project, Junk Food Politics, will be published by Johns Hopkins University Press and examines the, the increase and, uh, and uh, increased influence of, in policy of, um, of the food industry in, in developing countries. With, um, and he, well, he, he, he leads very important projects on research in, on non-transmittable diseases like diabetes and obesity in Mexico, Brazil, and Indonesia. He is also related to other organizations uh, like the Rockefeller Foundation, Boston University. His research has uh, had support from Oxfam, George Soros, and Tinker Foundations. And before coming to Lehigh recently, he, he, Dr. Gomez was an associate professor at the King's College London and a joint professor at Rutgers and has been a, a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, Harvard School of Public Health. And well, he's a veteran of the, of the Air Force and has, member, has been a member of the Council of, of International Relations. And we're very happy to have him here today also because he's leading a new initiative at The Lancet on, on politics, the importance of politics for health and understanding that the, the importance of, of politics and political science using the methodologies, the research on political sciences to, to lead to better results in health policy. Uh, unfortunately, um, Dr. Gomez has to leave a bit earlier than planned because of an uh, appointment he cannot change. Uh, Uh, one of these things that happens with passport offices. And um, so we're going to be a bit shorter than usual. So I better shut up now and allow Ms. Dr. Gomez to speak. Thank you, Dr. Gomez, for being oh, here. Thank you very much, Escala. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time today from your busy schedules. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, just one second here while I get it started. Uh, all right. Um, as Gustavo said, uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, I, this is a, a new series that uh, the Lancet Medical Journal is uh, doing work in political science and health. And uh, I'm very honored to be with all of you today and talk to you about this special series. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, as, uh, 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 as Gustavo mentioned, I'm an associate professor in the College of Health at Lehigh University. And uh, I'm a political scientist by training, working on global health politics and policy. For most of my career, I focused on Brazil, uh, which is uh, where I've done field work and lived and, and uh, started working on the politics of HIV AIDS um, when I was in graduate school. And then more recently, the BRICS countries and now looking at emerging economies, not only the BRICS, but other countries, Mexico, Indonesia, all from a political science perspective with a focus on institutional theory and more recently combining institutional theory, interest group theory. And, uh, and so this Lancet series is something that's new and it's something that uh, has, is new, completely new for the Lancet. Of all of you know, they're mainly traditionally focused on medical and public health publications. And so today uh, I'll be talking about the new series that we launched and the articles that were involved in the series. And then I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. So the series background started back in 2018 when I was living in London. 
And at the time, I, I realized that a lot of research uh, had been happening in the area of politics of global health. Of course, this was before COVID-19. And I was thinking mainly in terms of uh, the literature on the politics of AIDS, HNN1, SARS. And uh, I approached uh, the editor, uh, Dr. Richard Horton, who I'm sure all of you know is the editor of The Lancet, with the idea about a special series on political science and health. And I had been following um, Richard via on Twitter for, for, for a while and noticed his interest in politics. And so I noticed that there might be some interest on his end to sort of sponsor a series. And of course, he loved the idea and, um, and was completely on board with the whole idea of doing a special series. And then the next year, or later in 2018, I approached the Rockefeller Foundation. And thanks to their support, we were able to uh, bring together a group of scholars, political scientists, to have a conference in January of 2020 at the Lancet office. And so there were several individuals involved uh, uh, in this conference, both on Zoom and uh, or uh, uh, Skype or Zoom, and then in person. Uh, and then it took about uh, two years to finally have all the articles written, reviewed, uh, and then the COVID pandemic affected us, and, and a couple of indiv individuals could no longer participate. And finally, the series was published in uh, May of this year. And so what I'll do now is just talk about the overall goals and objectives of the of the series and then talk about the articles that were that were part of the series and, and conclude with some general comments. Uh, this is, of course, the first series uh, by the Lancet dedicated to the intersection of political science and health. And in this project, we sought to establish a, a bridge between political scientists and global health policymakers, exchanging ideas and information between academics and policymakers. Um, um, and what we noticed and what I know was that political scientists working in health tend to focus, of course, on uh, academic journals. And, uh, you know, that's sort of to be expected uh, for a discipline when you have people in the discipline writing for their discipline. They're not necessarily interested in writing for the general public or policymakers. And so it was really an effort to, to establish a bridge going forward so that political the, uh, scientists can write in ways that are understandable by policymakers and, and also to obtain uh, feedback from the policy community. So we had some individuals from the policy community involved in this project at our workshops who provided feedback on the approaches that political scientists were taking on global health. But we also sought to illustrate the international policy community the benefits of conducting a political science theoretical and methodological approach to understanding the policymaking process. So some of you may know political science scientists uh, look at politics through a variety of theoretical approaches at the international and domestic level. And the methodological method, methods is very diverse. We have individuals doing very sophisticated statistical work, uh, econometrics, uh, all the way to those that work on political theory and political philosophy. And so it's a very wide and different kind of uh, you know, spectrum of methodology. The thematic focus of the series uh, was mainly focused on three areas of political science. And this is, of course, is a wide, many areas of political science, but we found that we thought that these were the ones that had the most, entailed the most literature and research. The first is on institutions, the design of political and bureaucratic institutions, for example, checks and balances systems, uh, decentralization, uh, both within Congress and delegation of authority, um, constitutional delegation of authority. Second is interests, politicians, bureaucrats, and civil societies' interests in policy reform. And third, ideas, uh, individual and or collective beliefs, normative and technical, and how they influence policy. For example, human rights or belief that health policy is a human right. And so the series, all the articles in this series address these three themes. Some emphasize institutions more than others, some ideas, but they all recognize that these are all interrelated and that there's a vast literature in political science addressing these three themes. And though we thought it was a good idea to have uh, research that illustrated the effectiveness of this approach uh, to, to health policy. The first series in our art, or the first article in our series, was written by Jeremy Schiffman and Yusra Sharwar, both at the Johns Hopkins University. And their paper was titled Framing and, and the Formation of Global Health Priorities. 
In this article, they ask, why do some health issues receive greater international policy attention versus others? Policy does not reflect a global disease burden. For example, HIV AIDS treatment receives far more international financial and technical assistance than type two diabetes treatment, such as insulin. We know there are a lot more diabetics uh, around the world than there are individuals with HIV AIDS. Why is it that uh, insulin and diabetes is not receiving sufficient amount of attention? They argue that international framing of policy issues matters in trying to understand why some policies get more attention than others. And they define framing as not only how particular health issues are portrayed, but also the power, motivations, and strategies of the individuals and organizations who promote these frames. And quoting them here, framing is a socio-political process shaped by power. Three frames, uh, they focus on three frames in their article. First is securitization, seeing uh, diseases as, as, as a threat to the nation state and to individuals, for example, Ebola, H&N1. Uh, second, moralization, uh, the ethical imperative of responding to a disease such as HIV AIDS and, and responding based on a human right, for example. And technification, wise investments in science and, and that science can solve, such as investing scientifically to address neglected tropical diseases. Various actors, international, government, civil society, employ different forms of power to advance particular frames to secure attention and resources for policies that they prefer. So for example, they talk about the, the Gates Foundation offering grants in order to have countries comply with their particular policy approach in the World Bank as well, offering technical assistance in order to receive compliance to their prioritization and policies. Framing, however, is historically contingent. That is not, it's not inevitable that a particular framing will be used and it's often dependent on these power relations and interests. But they also find that global health elites often determine which frames prevail, which in quoting them here raises questions about the legitimacy of the priority setting process, but also highlighting the democratic deficit in agenda setting. So they do importantly raise that oftentimes, much like in governments, the elites uh, that have a lot of power and resources often set the agenda and priorities, and that this is showing a lack of attention to uh, participation of actors and empowerment of actors who are often uh, not influential due to their resources. And, and so, so they're highlighting that there's a dem democratic deficit when it comes to agenda setting at the international level. So their article in general talks about the importance of agenda setting politically at the global level, uh, the importance of uh, looking at uh, discourse frames. Uh, as, as if some of you have been following uh, Jeremy Schiffman and Yusra's work, uh, they've been working on this topic for many years. And so it provides a good example of how political science research and framing and discourse and, and sort of looking at policies from a framing perspective can be used to understand the complexities of international policy making. The next article by Carmen Ho, Hina Kilad, Kimberly Skead, and jo Joseph Wong talks about the politics of universal healthcare coverage. And in this article, they start off by arguing that achieving universal health coverage is an international goal, as we all know, that has been established for the United Nations for many decades. Still, governments have not achieved this, as we all know as well, that universal health care coverage and access is still not effectively found in most countries around the world. Achieving UHC is a political challenge. However, political science concepts are often overlooked in the literature. Here they explore how political science concepts of interests, ideas, and institutions shape uh, universal healthcare policy. They look at policy, but they also look at the same time uh, policy implementation and the challenges of implementing policy at the local level. And here they emphasize the importance of, importance of state capacity and ensuring that local governments have the ability to implement policy. And they highlight in this article, of course, the, the advantages of a principal agent relationships in the literature, where the central government, for example, the various ways of working with street level bureaucrats to implement policy. 
And they ultimately argue that achieving universal health care coverage, uh, it requires a high level of political commitment in all levels, but also effective implementation strategies. We cannot only look at the creation of policy, but also implementing policy effectively, and that there's different kinds of political science research and theories that address both of these issues. Uh, in the creation of policy, the interest ideas institutions approach provides insight into that and why is it that some policies are created, some are not, some countries are better than others in doing so. And then there's a vast literature on implementation and implementation, implementation science. And as you all know, this is a very big area of research and policy studies. And here political scientists have done a lot of work on street level bureaucracy, again, principal agent theoretical approaches, how the principal, the central government can uh, you know, incentivize local bureaucrats and establish incentives and ideas that are supported at both levels to ensure implementation. And uh, as many of you know, uh, Professor Wong has been working on this research on REACH, which strives to understand this process. And I understand that he has been working with Gustavo in this and, and, and done research with him on this topic. And, uh, and I think it's a wonderful article that sort of illustrates the importance of this topic and how political science can provide some insights into that, into that topic. The final article in the series is written by Professor Iona Kickbush and Austin Lee, titled Global Health Diplomacy, Restructuring Power and Governance. And global health diplomacy is a relatively new area of research that started primarily in the past 15 to 20 years uh, in response to the HIV AIDS research and, and, and or negotiations and relationships between states on accessing medicine and, and assistance in response to AIDS and is uh, now taking on various different topics in global health diplomacy and how governments relate to each other at the international level uh, over healthcare issues. In this particular article, they look at how concepts and theories in international relations have been used to better understand the role of power in global health diplomacy processes, for example, international negotiations. They use international relations theory to study global health diplomacy and how this can help to better understand the complexity of the global health policymaking process. As we, many of you may know, international relations theory is divided into many camps. You have realist theory, which looks at the anarchical world and where nation states use their power and resources to achieve their goals versus constructivist theory, which believes in the idea, the importance of ideas and institutions and multilateral institutions and sees nation states as complying more and working through institutions and norms um, uh, to achieve uh, you know, their, you know, the, their mutual interests. And in this article, they argue that we need to analyze power in global health diplomacy, but from more of a diplomatic form of power based on relationships between states and not resources. And here they, they, they build on the work of Barnett and Duval that argue that power is seen through relationships and how states relate to each other uh, and not from resources and, and direct bilateral efforts to, to advance those uh, uh, resources and interests. Through this approach, they argue that we need to return to the traditions of multilateralism in health, breaking away from nationalism and state distrust of international organizations, such as the World Health Organization. And of course, they look at the evolution of global health diplomacy now with the current COVID-19 context and find that, uh, that the, the approach to multilateralism has has weakened and where a lot of states are now pursuing, uh, responding to COVID-19 in an in a isolated context where they're not working through international organizations, where there's now in some countries a lack of trust in the international institutions. Uh, and so now more than ever, they highlight it's important that we start to look at different conceptions of international relations theory and try to advocate for a return to multilateralism where nations um, and, and powerful actors have more trust in multilateral institutions and relationship with other countries. But they also conclude their, their article by arguing that the global south and its regional coalitions can and should play a, a greater role in working together, uh, displaying power through multilateral diplomatic relationships, and that this is starting to happen. We're seeing regional blocks in the global south are coming together to sort of work to address the COVID-19 situation. And I think that this is sort of must be advocated for, especially in addressing issues such as lack of access to vaccines, uh, equitable access to vaccines uh, and uh, in response to COVID-19. 
So to conclude sort of the, what these, what the, the goal of the series was, um, the series was first published by the Lancet. It was the first Lancet publication to reveal the theoretical and methodological advantages of adopting a political science approach to global health policymaking. Now, I just want to emphasize that uh, the political science and health is a new, I would say, a new approach in global health, but it has a long tradition in uh, the American politics and other countries' domestic approaches to health. So uh, there have been there is a long established field of study in American politics that looks at the interplay of health politics and policy. But what's new, I think, is taking these approaches to the global level and seeing how uh, theories of politics can be incorporated at the international level and between countries. And so this was the first time the Lancet tried to reveal this kind of new research, which has been going on for many decades, but I think provides has provided a great opportunity for the international community to see what, what, what political science may offer and some new insights in this process. The contributors in this series, in this, in this series again, emphasize the interests, ideas, and institutions approach to reveal the benefits of adopting these theoretical approaches and what the policy community can learn. And it's important to emphasize that, however, there are many different areas of political science research um, that, that uh, need to be, uh, that can be looked at. For example, historical institutionalism, path dependency, interest group theory. These are areas that I focus in on. There's a lot of research that's needed in applying these theoretical approaches to global health policy and looking at policymaking at the international level and within governments in, in emerging economies. But uh, there are also some policy areas that I think would benefit from a political science perspective. Of course, non-communicable diseases, uh, type two diabetes, heart disease, all of these policies may benefit from applying different political science theoretical approaches and methodological approaches. Uh, why is it that countries aren't able to address simultaneously uh, effect or inc include effective type two diabetes self-care prevention programs while they're very effective at addressing obesity or other kinds of diseases? Uh, you know, what are the historical factors that limit government's abilities to do this? Uh, and another area that's very important, and I think that has been emerging, is the commercial determinants of health and looking at applying interest group theory in political science to understand why some industries, the junk food industry, soda and ultra processed food industries, why they are so powerful. Why is it that uh, non-communicable disease policies focusing on obesity prevention, for example, and uh, why is it that they're not working? And so one area of research that has recently, I think, emerged in the past five to 10 years is this commercial determinants of health and looking at how industries are using their power and resources to influence policies and to undermine these efforts to address um, uh, obesity, obesity policy, diabetes policy. And of course, in Mexico, this is very important. And this is an uh, area of research that I'm doing and a lot of other colleagues are doing, and I think benefits from political science approach. I've recently written an article for social science and medicine on the topic of political science and the commercial determinants of health in which I outline various theoretical approaches and a framework for addressing these issues. And if you're interested, I can send all of you a copy of that article. So I'm very pleased with, with what this uh, series accomplished. I think that uh, it has drawn a lot of attention to the area of excuse me, of political science. And uh, there is a podcast show on the Lancet website that has the articles. If any of you have time to listen into that show, myself and uh, Professor Jeremy Schiffman at Johns Hopkins are interviewed by the Lancet editors about why political science matters. Um, and I think that as you'll see in that that podcast in this series, and I'm sure all of us can agree that political science does matter, but we also need to, and we emphasize this, take politics more seriously. Now, politics, I believe, is a term that's liberal, liberally used by many in the scientific community. Of course, everything is politics, but how do we really measure, how do we really understand and measure and quantify and compare politics? And doing that requires that we really employ theories and methodologies, much about how we would with social movements, right? Everyone argues and talking about collective movements, uh, you know, uh, societal response and uprisings. Um, and there is a vast literature in sociology, collective movement theory, uh, both quantitative and qualitative. And uh, in, 
addressing those theoretical frameworks and seeing how you know those what new research questions and insights they provide, I think is the next step in our in our journey to understanding policy making, global health policy making. Uh, and so, you know, what, how can we use theory to pose new research questions? What does institutional change theory, for example, the area that I work in, um, how does that lead to new research questions or interest group theory? And so I think that there's a lot more that needs to be done in the global health policy literature that, it, that engages these theories, the different kinds of methodologies um, for addressing this topic. And finally, there is a, a, a need for greater collaboration between political scientists, public health, and medical community. Um, you know, when I started my, my academic career in graduate school, uh, uh, while I was in graduate school, as Gustavo mentioned, I was at the Harvard School of Public Health for uh, several years, writing my PhD uh, dissertation. Um, and I, at the time, there was two or three people in the, uh, that I knew of there work as political scientists working uh, in health, and it's changed dramatically over the years. And I think there's more political scientists working with uh, uh, medical community, but that there needs to be a lot more. There needs to be a lot more engagement. Now, why is it that political scientists often are not often sought out? Um, there could be differences in methodologies. Uh, uh, there's there could be maybe a lack of rec lack of recognition from the medical community about about political scientists. And this is why we thought this series was important, so that the medical community and public uh, uh, health community can see what political science does and uh, what individuals doing a sophisticated approach to political science, what they can provide. So uh, we hope that this series will provide uh, more incentives for collaboration between uh, political science and the medical community, public health community. And of course, I'm very honored to work with anyone and, uh, uh, that is interested in, in working with me on any topics, uh, especially with the Institute on, uh, on Obesity that Gustavo is, is leading. I think this is a very, very important topic, uh, timely topic. Uh, I'm currently doing research on type 2 diabetes uh, and obesity through the commercial determinants, but uh, we have a BMJ Global Health series that is coming out in the next couple, couple of weeks. Uh, in which we talk about the politics of non-communicable diseases and in conflict areas and, and situations. And, and so what do you do in a context, for example, in the Ukraine or in high conflict uh, situations where diabetics need access to self-care management services? And so I think there's a lot of, uh, this is something I'm very passionate about and, and would love to do more research with any of you on. And, uh, and finally, the, the Lancet is, of course, very receptive to any kind of uh, ideas about uh, another series or papers. I think that this series a lot opens the door for any of you that have been interested in exploring these topics from this perspective. And, uh, and uh, I think this is a timely and important effort. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and, and conclude and, uh, and uh, open to up to any questions that any of you may have. And if any of you have any further um, questions, please feel free to, to contact me via email. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, link to our, my, my website as well. I uh, would be happy to meet with any of you and to, to learn more about your work. Thank you very much, um, Eduardo. This is a, a very interesting and, and valuable presentation that you gave for us. And I mean, I mean, I really think you make a very clear case of the relevance of uh, understanding better this intersection between politics, health, and how this can inform also policy decisions. I think it's uh, this series is particularly, I mean, it's general, generally very important, but it's particularly timely now. I mean, we've seen with the COVID pandemic, the vast diversity in country response. Uh, and much of that is uh, the result of politics as well, how each country has decided to respond to the, to the, to the pandemic. And, uh, but it, it affects in general. I mean, I, I think your example on uh, that one of the papers you quoted on, on on the attention given to HIV relative to diabetes too uh, shows clearly part of this problem. Now, how decisions do not necessarily follow the burden of disease or the impact in a given country, but also many other factors. So, so I, I really think this is a very important also to look at uh, other, I mean, for example, the WHO says the greatest challenge to health, global health is obviously the climate crisis. Again, here is something where we have to 
to focus on. So, so this is a very timely series and, and certainly uh, encourages us to work more, more on this. And um, I will, I don't know if any of the audience has any, any questions they would like to ask. If I might just start with one, uh, you were finishing your comment saying, uh, uh, well, the, the, the series has already some, some papers, but maybe some of the colleagues want to work on, on other uh, papers. The, how do they fall within, the, would, would, if they are sent to the loans that are published, do they fall within the series or that was, uh, I mean, this is just three papers, but it shows the interest of the Lancet to publish work on these topics, or I don't know if you could address that. And then sure. uh, I see some people raise their hands as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, the, the, the editor, uh, the senior editors uh, the, are, are, are very much, this series reflects their interest. So of course, the, uh, the whole, the, they're very open to a, a wide variety of perspectives on political science. And of course, they would go through the regular peer review process, but it, it certainly reveals that they are uh, committed and interested in receiving papers that address this topic. And, um, and, uh, and so if any of you are interested, I can certainly introduce you to the series editor, Jessamy Bajanal, uh, um, uh, who is the editor for this, this particular series in politics or the managing editor. And of course, Richard Horton would be involved as well. Um, they are very much interested in diverse, diverse topics in political science and health. Um, you know, there's a lot of topics in ethics uh, uh, from ethics to to corporate interests to to institutions, and so if any of you are interested, I think that uh, you know certainly uh, you know there there is there is a standard procedure for you know submitting articles, and then um, I'm sure they would be very receptive or welcoming to any questions you may have about about their 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 uh, their uh, their series. But it's a it's a great great opportunity. I think it's fantastic that they that this that they, that they are so they're interested in this topic and and uh, this is a certainly new area for the journal and and I'm sure are very excited to to possibly work with any of you that are interested in that topic. Thank you. I think Abril Campos from the WHO has a question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Thank you very much, Eduardo. This is really important work that you are leading. Um, I, I think the work does a really good job in showing the explanatory power of, of political science approaches and methods. I think that a gap is that uh, how do we integrate uh, these political uh, science approaches into the adoption, development of policy, etc. Like I feel like we're missing, um, you know, what works in applying political science approaches to increase the likelihood of success. I think we focus so much on the explanatory power, which is which is great. We, like political science can help us understand, can help us explain what happened. I, I think, and, and I think it's hard because we, we you know, with colleagues in WHO, we, we published a, a short article on, on normalizing the use of political economy analysis in our technical assistance work. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. there's like a lack of evidence base for that. You know, how do we show that? I think I think it's good to show that we can explain things, but we need to show that by using these approaches, we can increase the likelihood of policy, you know, success. And, and I wonder that if in your work, you know, for this, for this series, you came across these, you, you, when you talk to people, who is working on these, how can we help kind of build this body of knowledge about what works in, in using political science to improve health outcomes, you know, to yes. improve the effectiveness of policies? That's a wonderful question, Abril, uh, and it's something that has, that is something I've always been worried about, uh, you know, ever since, you know, as I'm sure I'm saying with you, you know, how do we convince policymakers to listen to political scientists and, and adopt that? And, and it's all, it's all, uh, we can say whatever, we can provide as much information as we, as we want, but how do we convince policymakers to spend the time and listen and adopt? Uh, and that's something that is a, in a big challenge. Um, and it's something that we talked about in our work in our workshops as well. And what we can do is do our best to provide information through publications in the Lancet, but also encourage if we know government leaders to read the publications and invite political scientists and those working in political sciences to give presentations and to reveal the importance um, to policymakers. Ultimately, it's their decision to uh, explore new approaches to policymaking. But as we all know, politicians and, and, and bureaucrats, um, you know, there's always, it's difficult doing that. It's difficult 
The policymaking process is so different in every context. Uh, some institutions, some governments are more receptive to new ideas versus others. Um, but I think that, that this certainly is a topic that needs to be addressed and how do we connect and show theory and actually have an impact in the policy process. I think at the global level, the WHO, there, there's more opportunity for that. But you know, at the domestic government level, it ultimately depends on how willing and receptive the governments are to these alternative ideas from political science. And so that I think that is the biggest challenge. And, and that would require really working with country representatives within the WHO, the UN, or you know, encouraging them to invite political scientists, scientists to work to give presentations to ministries um, and to you know, reveal this kind of research. Uh, but that is a great question. I mean, that's one reason why we tried to do this, we did this theory, this series is to try and, and raise attention at the global level among policymakers that are reading the Lancet regularly uh, to see these different approaches and topics. Uh, but, uh, but I think this, I, I think that's a very great, and I, I don't have a clear answer to that, but I think it's something that, that we need to really address. And, uh, and, uh, and, and this is an excellent question. Thank you, Abdul. Thank you. Is there any other question from the audience? Okay, I don't, I don't see another question. Well, uh, Eduardo, I, I think, as I was saying, you the, 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 the series is very timely and uh, and indeed we have to work much more on, on, on using the methods from political science and from policy analysis to, to really understand what's going on and to provide a better uh, ideas and knowledge how to improve health results overall. So, uh, well, thank you very much for this, and uh, I'm sure that uh, several of our colleagues are probably thinking in their minds, ah, no, I have to write about this, <laughs> <laughs> work on this topic. We certainly are at the, at the School of, of, of um, Government of the, of, of the Tech de Monterrey thinking about this. So, so thank you very much, and um, hope you get in time to your point that you have to make <laughs> oh yes thank you so much everyone my apologies again for being short uh there is a uh, uh i have to renew my passport i'm leaving this uh this weekend and so we have to make an appointment in advance and you can't miss the appointment so yeah. i appreciate you all of you uh, uh you know the limited time and thank you very much gustavo it's been an honor to to meet to meet you and to talk to all of you and uh, I will be visiting. The plan is to visit Mexico in in, in August. And uh, I did spend time at UNAM and uh, loved my time there. And and um, planning to restart my my work with researchers there. And so I, I really appreciate it. And and certainly, if any of you are interested in, in talking more about the Lancet series and and sort of um, and, and and obtaining information on how to approach uh, this the series, please feel free to contact me at any time. And uh, and thank you so much, uh, Gustavo. It's uh, and 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 uh, and Danielle for this wonderful invitation. And I hope to to see all of you in the near future. Great, thanks, Eduardo, thank and you thank much. you all for for coming to this seminar. And we we'll let you know of the new sem next seminars part of the series we are having. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.